Thank you for that edifying song that we just had. If you'll excuse me, I may have to depend on my water just a little bit more as the day goes on. I have almost been afflicted with a Fleming throat that kind of gets weaker as you talk. What we're going to talk about now is justification and grace. Now, we have asked the question, what is going to be our avenue into heaven? Just how do we get to heaven? You know, when a person is saved, there are a couple of things that happen. One of them has the biblical term or the theological term justification. Another one has the term sanctification. And that's why we've entitled this talk and the next one justification and sanctification and grace. We're going to talk first about this justification and grace. You see, as a man stands outside Jesus Christ, realizes his sin and his need for salvation, a person then moves from his position into Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us in many passages that we are baptized into Christ or we are placed in Christ. There are value of being in Christ. Two of the most common scriptures, Romans 6, 3 which he says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now we'll get to both of those passages later on in our talk, but I want to present the idea that when a person is placed inside Jesus Christ, that is what we call justification. Justification, in defining our terms right quick, justification is the act of God in declaring men free from guilt and acceptable to Him. Being made just in the eyes of God. It is a legal jury, a jury statement or a legal pronunciation of innocence, of guilt-freeness from the Almighty God about you or I. Now this, this word is used <clears throat> many times in the Bible, primarily in the book of Romans. It's seven times or eleven times in the book of Romans. Uh, There's the word justified and just. And there are many Greek words, several Greek words that make this up. Another definition that is common in justification or being justified is the state of him who is as he ought to be. When I stand before God justified, I am in the eyes of God as I should be. I'm as I ought to be. It's righteous standing before God. And the final definition of justified or righteousness is integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking or feeling and acting. This is a system of righteous standing with God of behavior that's appropriate to a Christian. But the justification we're going to spend the primary bulk of our time talking about is this justification that is the act of God which accounts believers so that you stand before Him just like you had never, ever sinned. You stand before Him as one who has not been guilty. You have been declared righteous by the justice of God and are acquitted of any guilt before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, if this paper represents my life and the things that I've done, you could open it and read all about it. The idea of justification is that I am placed in Jesus Christ and now when God looks at me, He sees Jesus Christ. He sees the perfect, spotless, blameless life of the Son of God Instead of seeing the failures and the weakness and the frailties of me and my life. Now, I don't think there's any better place to study this than the book of Romans. So if you have a Bible, I'd ask you to grab your Bible and we're going to look at the book of Romans. We're going to start in chapter 1 and I'm going to give you just a little background here on 1, 2, and 3. In chapter 1 and 2, God here through Paul talks about Gentiles. And God says to the Gentiles, you are condemned. Now, a Gentile didn't have the law of God. You remember the law of Moses was written to people who were Jewish. A Gentile wasn't amenable to the Jewish law. 
So what law was he guilty of violating? Well, he says in Romans chapter 2, you have violated the law in your heart. You know, every one of us inherits as we grow to adulthood and maturity a basic knowledge of right and wrong, of good and evil. And that's what we inherit from Adam and Eve that they got when they ate the fruit of that tree is a knowledge of good and evil. And with that knowledge of good and evil comes the inevitable truth that we are going to violate what we know is good and we are going to do what we know is evil. Now, I don't expect we've got any Jews here today, do we? No, we're all Gentile people. Romans 1 and 2 are about us. We're condemned because we violated the law of God. That law in our heart, written in all of our hearts. Chapters 2 and 3, he talks about the Gentiles. He, or excuse me, the Jews. Chapter 2 and 3, he says, Jews, you're no better than the Gentiles. You had the law of God. He delivered it to you through Moses on the mountain. You had it, you brag about it, and you don't obey it. And because you don't obey it, you have violated His law and you are just as guilty as the one who has been guilty of breaking the law in his heart. You're no better than the Gentiles. And in chapter 3, he brings this to summation. We've got, he's talked about those who are striving, or he will talk about those who strive to walk to heaven, climb that ladder to heaven on good works, those who try to climb the ladder to heaven on Bible knowledge, those who try to climb the ladder to heaven on moral goodness, and I have to tell you, my wife told me to take these slides out. She said, they're the only ones that don't fit. And I said, well, I like them, so I'm going to leave them in. <laughs> People try to get to heaven a lot of different ways. We're going to find out the way we can get to heaven here, though, in Romans. Look in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19 for his explanation of the law. Romans 3.19, he says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. The primary purpose of law, go on to our next slide there. The primary purpose of law is that we may be guilty before God. You know, the Bible, you, if you look at the commands of God as links in a chain. If you hold on to that chain and you obey all those laws, you're hanging by that chain. How many links have to break for you to fall? Well, you all know the answer. Just one link, right? Sure, little guy falling there, okay? If one link breaks, you fall. That's what the law does to people. The law points out where you've broken. You don't have to break all the commandments. He says over in James chapter 2, if any man offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now what that means is not if you tell a lie, God says, oh, you're a murderer and adulterer. That's not what that means. What that means is you failed. You're a lawbreaker. That's what sin is. Sin is breaking the law of God. And here he says in this verse, he says the purpose for the law was to stop people's excuses, to shut their mouths, and to make all men guilty before God. Have you ever experienced that? When you read in the, in the Bible? I tell you what, just look at the Ten Commandments sometime. You look at the Ten Commandments. We're studying the Ten Commandments in one of our study groups at home. And just going through them one at a time and talking about them. You know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So it's, oh, I don't worship a totem pole or a little fat Buddha statue or anything. But you know, when you really study that, You'll be shaking your head going, ooh, I have been guilty of that. There are other people or other things that I've placed ahead of God in my life. And you can just go right down through all those commands. The law of God is for that purpose. Paul will tell us when we get to Romans 7, I hadn't known sin until the law of God came along. And then it showed me and I go, oh man, I'm guilty of this sin. That's what God's law is for. And friends, there's nothing wrong with using His law that way. That's the value of His law. It points out the sin and the failure and error in our lives. So now let's look at verse 23. He says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's law points out sin because everybody has been guilty of it. Now verse 26. Here's where he lays down his basic thesis for what he's going to talk about. He says, 
to declare, I say, that this time his right, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And the question is, how can he be just and justify the one who believes in Jesus? Now, let's look in Romans chapter 4. Go on to Romans chapter 4. And evidently my slides are a little crooked there. Leland, if you'll just back up one slide and I'll tell you when to go on to this one. Let's leave that one up there. Romans 4 and verse 1. He's going to answer this question. How can God be just and let you and I who are guilty go as if we're innocent? How can He do that? And He starts with Abraham. Because everybody agrees Abraham was righteous. That's the one guy, we, even the Islam, the nation of Islam agrees that Abraham was righteous. So let's start with him. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh is found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. For what say the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of debt, but of gra or grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now what's he say about Abraham? He said, we all know he was righteous. How did he get righteous? Well, if he's righteous because of his works, because he lived a righteous life, man, we're all in good shape. He can just walk right up and knock on the door and say, let me in. He said, but that's not the way Abraham was righteous. Do you remember Abraham? Do you remember what he did on the way to Egypt? Stopped at the last little coffee shop this side of Egypt, and he told his wife, he says, Sarah, you're a fine-looking lady. Now, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, and that's a good thing to tell your wife, guys. But then he said, and I know those Egyptians, and one of them's going to want you, and I want you to know right now, he can have you. I ain't fighting. <laughs> now, can you imagine a man of God doing that? He did it twice. And then there was the situation with Hagar, the handmaiden. That wasn't right. Abraham wasn't a perfect man. So how was Abraham righteous? Well, he said Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness or credited to his account. That's, that's what that imputed word means that we'll talk about here in a minute. Now then, verse 4 and 5, he says, To him that works, the reward is not reckoned of grace but of debt, but to him that works not but believes on the... On him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, here's where he gets into explaining it. If I hire you to work for me, let's say I'm going to pay you $10 an hour. Okay? My house needs painting. And I'm going to pay you $10 an hour to paint my house. And you come to my house and you start working and you start painting. And you work for eight hours. At the end of that eight hours, you come to me and you say, Brother Mike, I worked eight hours today. What do you expect me to do? give you $80, right? Be it a check or cash or something. You want $80. If I say, well, thanks, appreciate it, and send you on your way, are you going to be happy with me? No. Why not? Because you earned $80. If I pay you $80 and you've worked hard for eight hours, are you going to go around bragging about, oh, Brother Mike, he is the most generous. Well, $10 is pretty good, but it's not. I mean, you can make that a lot of places. Maybe not work as hard as painting a house. You see, that's something you've earned. It's a debt that I owe you now if you have worked for me. But let's just say at the lunch break, we're all standing around talking. I say, hey, come here. I want to talk to you for a second. And we come over to the side. And I say, you know, I just appreciate you. And I, I just want to give you this check right here for $1 billion. Okay? And I write you out, and it'll bounce. <laughs> but if I could give you a check for $1 billion, did you earn that? So I say, oh, no, I didn't earn that. You hadn't even painted my house for me. Did you earn a billion? You say, well, no, I didn't earn a billion dollars. You couldn't earn a billion dollars. Did you know at $10 an hour it would take 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, 50,000 years to earn a billion dollars? You can't earn a billion dollars. Your salvation is more valuable than a billion dollars. I promise you Bill Gates would give every penny he has not to go to hell. Money is not valuable compared to salvation. Salvation is so valuable, so vastly valuable, that we can't purchase it. You can't go, well, Lord, you know, I, I went to church every time the door was open. 
And Lord, you know, I was really tempted to change that number on my tax return, but I didn't because I knew you. And Lord, I would tried real hard to drive the speed limit even and wear my seatbelt. And Lord, that stuff, is, that stuff is nothing. It's meaningless. Salvation is a gift. Salvation is that valuable. Now jump down to verse... Oh, let's go down to verse 20. Still talking about Abraham. He says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what He had promised, He was able also to perform. Picture Abraham. He's almost 100 years old. They've never been able to have kids. His wife is almost 90. God comes down to him and He says, Abraham, you and Sarah are going to have a son. That'd be hard to believe, wouldn't it? We can't have a son, Lord. We've tried for years and years and years. We can't have a son. Besides, even if we could, she's too old to have kids now, and she never could start with, but even if she could, if she's too old now, and I'm too old, this was triple impossible. God said, Abraham, you're going to have a son. You know what Abraham did? He looked over at his dried up old prune of a wife snoring in her rocking chair. <laughs> And he said, honey, we need to get a nursery ready. He believed God even though it was impossible. He believed God even though everything he saw and knew and understood said differently. He believed God. He had faith that God was going to give him that son. Abraham was a man of tremendous faith. God said, see the stars? God took him outside and said, look at the sky, Abraham. I'm going to make your descendants just like all those stars. A few years later, he says, here's your son of promise. A few years after that, he says, take him to the mountain and kill him. Do what? Now wait a minute, God. Don't you remember that time I was looking at the sky? And you... That's not what he said. Okay, boy, come on, let's go. We've got to go to the mountain. Now wait a minute. You're going to kill the boy that's the son of promise. What happened to the promise? That's God's problem. <laughs> You know, God's got to raise him from the dead. He's got to raise him from the dead. That's his business. He told me it was going to happen. It's going to happen. He believed God. And because of that belief, he was counted righteous. Verse 22, Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. He was credited with being righteous even though he had failure and sin in his own life. He says, verse 23, Now it was not written for His sake alone that it was imputed to Him, but also for us to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He said, I'm not writing this just to tell you about the patriarch and how the patriarch was righteous. I'm writing this so you will understand how you get righteous. So you'll understand how you can stand righteous in the eyes of God. Well, how is that, Paul? The very same way that Abraham did, by faith. By unwavering, unshaking, undoubting faith. By a living faith that accepts the Word of God even when you have no visible proof. He said, you get dunked in a tub of water and you have faith that God will wipe away your sins. How do you know that happened? They weren't floating on the water when I came up. How do I know that happened? Faith. I believe God, God meant it when He said it. I believe it's true. It's faith. That living faith. God said it's always the best and right thing to do to tell the truth. You know, there's some times it seems to me like it would really be better to fudge just a little on the truth. Doesn't it? I mean, honestly, aren't there times it seems like it sure save a lot of trouble and hurt feelings if we just omit a little of the truth or change the truth a little bit? God said to speak the truth in love. And that's always right. Living faith believes what God says. You know, I heard an illustration of this that really helped me understand it. He says, when you have that kind of faith, you're going to be counted righteous, imputed or credited with righteousness. Even though you didn't earn the righteousness, you will be given or credited with that righteousness. There was a fellow who was a shepherd out in the fields in, in Scotland, and one day a little orphan lamb he heard over in the, in the pasture, and he went over to check on it, and he found it and brought it in. 
And there was no mother. He didn't know where it came from. It wasn't one of his flock. And he was concerned about this little orphan lamb. So he brought it into his fold and he tried to get one of his mother's sheep to nurse and take care of the lamb. But the lamb, the mother would look at it and you know how an animal recognizes one another by smell and, and it knew it wasn't its own and it, it just kept refusing and rejecting the little lamb. And the little lamb just kept getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And it was going to die. He tried every trick he'd heard of. And he couldn't get it to nurse. And so finally, out of desperation one day, he took this little orphan lamb and he took the mother sheep's own baby and he took him out behind the barn and he took a knife and he killed the mother sheep's own baby and he skinned it. And he took that skin and he laid it over that little orphan lamb and he brought that little orphan lamb back in to the mother. And the mother recognized the sin of her own child and she accepted and saved and raised the little orphan lamb. God cannot accept us. We have <laughs> sinned beyond acceptance. He will not. We are not one of His own now. We have chosen to go away from Him. But God loved you and me so much. He said, I'll send my Son and He will live a perfect, spotless, blameless life. And then I'll let you kill Him and I will credit you with His perfect life. And when I look at you, I'll see Him. And when I see Him, I'll accept you as my own because of His righteousness. That's the justification that comes by grace. And there's nothing we can do to earn that. Notice what he says in the next verse, chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have peace with God because I'm doing what He wants me to do. I have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Look, jump down to verse 8. And I want you to notice all the focus on Jesus. God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. All of the focus is on Jesus. All of the salvation is Him. It's what He's done. It's what He purchased. It's His blood. It's not mine. It's His good works, not mine. It's His sacrifice, not mine. And that's the way God showed His love to you and I. Now he goes ahead and talks about that so much more here. I want to jump down oh, to about verse 15. And I want you to notice this one phrase that just keeps showing up over and over and over in these verses. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign by one life, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, Friends, there is no way you can read this with an honest heart and think salvation is anything other than a free gift. There's just no way to do that. God says over and over and over and over and over, righteousness is a free gift. It's a gift that I want to give to you. It's something I want to put in your hands. It's something that I want to deliver to you that you didn't earn. It's something you have added nothing to. It's something that's not based on your abilities, on your strength, on your cleverness. 
It's a gift. You know, at Christmas time, we always exchange gifts. Now, the older I get and the more the family's spread out and the more people there are, sometimes we just don't give as many gifts as we used to and get as many gifts as we used to. But we give gifts. And when I give someone a gift, it's not something that they did something to earn. It's something that I chose of myself and my own life, my own volition, to give to them because I love them. And I want, you know, some couples do this, well, I'll go buy my Christmas gift and you go buy yours. <laughs> That's really not a gift from somebody else. A gift is, I love you and I wanted to get this for you. I wanted to give this to you. And it's not a gift that I give to you on the condition that you do this and 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 then you can have the gift. It's a gift that I give to you because I love you and I care about you. Friends, our salvation, our righteous standing before God is something that you could never earn. I wish we had time, although we don't, to go through all of the details of chapters 4 and 5. But I do want to get to the next verse. The next verse in verse 20 says this, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. One time I went camping with a friend of mine, and he was a young man in the church, several years younger than me, and he asked me a question. He said, Mike, what do you do when you just broke your 500th promise to God? And we were sitting there in the woods with a crackling fire and sitting on a log. That's a pretty good question, isn't it? Anybody else ever wondered that? I have. What do you do when you've promised God and you've promised Him over and over and over? You know, I, I mentioned this question to somebody one time and they said, well, same thing you do when you break your first promise to God. <laughs> well, you know, that's, there is truth in that and we'll talk about that in a minute, but... That's a good question. If my righteous standing before God depends on how good I can be, there comes a point where you just... I know there comes a point if you keep messing with me and you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, eventually I'm going to get tired of it and I'm going to say, you know what, don't apologize anymore, just fix it. I'm tired of hearing it. Don't you think sometimes God gets that way? He just gets tired of me. Me, oh, please forgive me again. I won't ever do it again. And I turn right around and I've done it again. What's the answer to that? The answer's in this verse. He said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That means that pile of sin you had right there that we were looking at a minute ago, grace just wipes it out. And if there's more sin, you know what happens? Grace just wipes it out. And if there's more sin, you know what happens? Grace just wipes it out. It doesn't matter how big that mountain of sin gets, there's enough grace to cover it. I'll tell you what, that, this makes my brethren uncomfortable. This verse does. This verse used to make me very uncomfortable. Because you know what the logical conclusion to that is? Logical conclusion is what we're going to get into after lunch. But the logical conclusion is, then that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> Like this young man said, we sat down and we studied Romans 4 and 5 by firelight that night. And we got down to the end of Romans chapter 5. And he looked at me and he said, you got to tell people this. People don't know this. <laughs> well, you know, that's true. We need to tell people this. It's very important. I want to say, I know it's important for everybody, but it is so important for young people to understand this. All of you, I'm encouraged by all the young people. You are so blessed to be involved with congregations that are concerned about teaching these things to you while you're young. You have no idea. You need to know that no matter what you've ever done, no matter how bad you've ever messed up, God will never, ever quit loving you. And there will never, ever be a time when your sin is so big and so bad and so ugly that God won't welcome you home with open arms. That is critical and fundamental to our ability to live a successful Christian life. You're going to fail. 
you're going to make terrible mistakes. And you're going to do things that you hate to even remember. And it's going to make you ashamed all by yourself when you remember that you did those things. I hope you won't. But the truth is we're all going to do that. You need to remember when, if you ever wake up in the pig pen where the prodigal son was, you need to remember that you can go home to daddy. You can go home to your father in heaven because no matter how much sin, no matter how big and ugly that pile is, there's grace to save it. You know, used to when I do Bible stage with people, sometimes they'd tell me, Mike, they'd say, you just don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. And I used to say, well, you never murdered anybody, did you? Until one guy said, yes, one time. I quit asking that question. I've got a better question now. I say, you never murdered anybody just because they were a Christian, did you? I've never had a yes to that question. But if I do, I've got an answer. Then you're as wicked as the Apostle Paul was. Welcome to the joys of your Father. Anybody at any time, anywhere, can be right with God. God loves you. You have been unfaithful. You have been unwise. You have been rebellious. But you have never, ever been unloved. And you will never be unloved. This favor of God, this grace, which is His favor, when He looks at you, He just loves you. And there's no explanation for it. There's no rhyme or reason for it. There's no reason He ought to. But He does. He just loves you. And that will never, ever stop. I've come to the understanding after having children, I learned a lot of things. I didn't know how my parents loved me until I had kids. And I've come to the understanding that no matter what your children ever do, they can get kicked out of the house. But daddy will always love his kids. Sorry, Leela. That's the way God's love is for you and me. There's no amount of failing and mistakes that will make Him quit loving you. And that is the news of grace. And that's the message we need. We have had for years people who've been burdened under the, the assumption and the failed belief that I haven't been good enough. No, you haven't and you never will be. But God loves you anyway, and He always will. You need to learn and know this. Now, there is another part to this story. When I learned this, I was just like that young man. i got to tell people. And I started preaching Romans 4 and 5. And sometimes I did the old pendulum swing, and I forgot to preach 6 and 7. So if you'll come back after lunch, we'll get into Romans 6 and 7, which is the balance of this story, the rest of the good news. Thank you.